manage to finish on time, there is a reception upstairs. We will be uh, opening up a photo exhibit uh, for a, an exhibition called A Peaceful Place or So It Looks from Space, featuring photographs by Swiss photographer Marco Grope. I was just upstairs and I can tell you the portraits of some of the Apollo astronauts and of Alexei Leonov are excellent. Plus, our Swiss colleagues have been very kind in uh, organizing a reception for us. So the sooner we finish, the sooner we can get to the drinks. Uh, and with that, it gives me great pleasure to present uh, a final panel with a word on how to move forward. And of course, this particular panel features the directors of each of the uh, co-organizers of this, of this conference. So of course, um, you'll see some faces here that you already recognize. And now we can look to them to see from all of their experiences how we might move forward. And it gives me great pleasure to present my former boss and mentor, Mr. Nicholas Hedman from the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs. Thank, thank you, Daniel. And uh, before, before we start, you said this is the last final mile. Isn't there a song from the 90s or 80s that said and we can walk a thousand more? <laughs> okay, so I know we are late in the day and you now expect this panel to uh, come up with all the solutions. Well, if we fail, we still have a closing session where Paul Mayer will definitely come up with a final conclusion. So, but we're doing the best, and I hope that this panel can at least shed some lights on where we think that the next step for multilateral dialogue should be and should focus on. Uh, before giving the floor to uh, my fellow panelists, I, I would like to make a, just a brief introduction um, this panel is closely associated with the first panel you remember from yesterday morning, uh, taking stock. So taking stock, then over those days we have heard a lot of, of, of technical uh, and detailed perspectives of various uh, notions, and now we are looking ahead. Um, I uh, took out some, some few um, perspectives that were raised in the first panel yesterday. And for instance, the CD should be more clear, with strengthened links to other UN fora. Space safety is becoming increasingly important and in focus in several multilateral fora and dialogues. TCBM is a stepping stone in all processes on safety, security, and sustainability of outer space activities. GGE Paros, regardless of its outcome, resulted in a valuable debate addressing up-to-date issues and concerns. There is an issue of mandates of the multilateral fora under consideration. The multilateral fora have different aims and objectives which lead to issues on where to hold more technical discussion. Interdisciplinary dialogue and cross-cutting processes is welcome but how to advance further and how efficient is it? So those are just some, some uh, food for thought. And I now give the floor to my fellow panelists. We will do it in the order of Renata, Peter, Paul, and Xavier. And they will have like three, five minutes um, to express their thoughts on the way ahead. Then we will have questions and an engaging debate. So Renata, please. Thanks very much, Nicholas. And as you're bringing up music, I wish I was called Mary, and then we would really have the whole Peter Paul Mary uh, theme, music thing going. Um, I, I'm really sort of, I have to say, a bit uh, flabbergasted at how we can sum up such a rich discussions and some of the themes that really were uh, very dense uh, uh, discussions and very rich discussions. So I'm going to just, uh, building on from the first session, in which, uh, as you reminded us, Nicholas, this is bringing us back to that, I'm going to just throw out a few challenges that I think um, are there we present ourselves when we think about how do we tackle safe space security governance. And then there's some suggestions that, of things that I've picked up. It's not at all meant to be definitive. So when we, what has struck me, and it really struck me in the discussion to just finish now on verification, when we approach space security from our arms control and disarmament perspectives, we bring with us a whole set of mindsets of how we think about regulation and governance of problems. And I feel that that's bringing us down to some very dead ends. And I think there are three particular challenges that present itself for why we're, we're encountering such challenges. The first is, 
we're in a moment of huge tech technological advance. Um, we heard about this throughout the workshop, just at the speed of advance and where we're going. Arms control arrangements typically arrive when, when you've reached a plateau in technological development, or you're even on the way down. So countries think, OK, I've got it. I understand it. I know where it's going. Now I'm prepared to negotiate around it. Um, and that is really a challenge for us when we want to think about space security, because the, the technological process is going this way. And we're thinking essentially about what are constraints at a moment where people are actually only beginning to invest. So that really presents some problems for us using these formal frameworks. The second is the multiplicity of actors. You, we talked about that a lot, of course, of the day. And, you know, the multiplicity of actors mean that many of the ways we have regulated challenges before, bilateral discussions or regulations or regional level approaches, are really challenged by uh, the range of new actors coming in in terms of it. There's an irony that I think the range of new actors we're seeing and the fact that it's not necessarily one part of the world or another is really forcing us to think about multilateralism for addressing space. And I actually felt that today's and yesterday's discussions reinforced for me the perspective of that we do need a, a multilateral framework for, for advancing uh, and that we need to, to, to reinforce that commitment. And then I think there's, a, there's also the private sector, the non-state actors that came up in all the discussions about commercial actors and, and how we balance that. That's not something that typically in arms control we have frameworks for. And, and it really presents us with some dilemmas. And the Conference of Disarmament with its rules and procedures and structures and systems is a good example of that. So we've got multiplicity of actors. We've got a moment of technological advance. And then we have convergence. And I really want us to just reflect on that. Um, you talk about cross-cutting issues. We heard it the first morning. But really, I feel that we, um, our instruments are structured around segregation. They're structured around taking physical attributes, measuring them, and then um, being very clear and distinct about them. And what we've seen time and time in every single panel discussion is dual use. We've seen the inter interaction between space and almost every issue. And all the areas where we've identified gaps are issues that don't sit properly in peaceful uses and don't sit properly in only security focus. So debris, uh, space situational awareness, uh, electronic and cyber warfare, cy cyber in general. And I, and I feel, therefore, that we have to accept that the frameworks and the ways that we approach arms control and disarmament when it comes to space security are going to be problematic if we want to have uh, an effective response to, to, what, to these new and emerging spaces. So what, what, do we, what do I take away from the discussions? I took away a growing acceptance of the blurring and the overlap. I've been in some discussions some years previously where there was a much more uh, commitment to peaceful uses being something here, space security being another. So at least a recognition of some overlap issues. And then I wonder if we might just need to take a more pragmatic approach to how we think about regulatory challenges moving away from perhaps overarching uh, frameworks and maybe even legally binding frameworks, but to look at what we described in the first morning as an emerging corpus and body of instruments and norms that might, we might engage in. From principles and guidelines, we talked about the TCBMs, we talked about GA resolutions, and might there be a, a willingness to identify two, three, or four of those and a coordinated approach between Vienna, New York, and Geneva about how we might think of those. Uh, and tackle those. And so, for example, uh, in terms of norms, norms of self-restraint, is the ASAP test guidelines uh, uh, an instrument that might be ripe for discussions? It, accepting that it would be voluntary, accepting that it would be norms. But India's uh, latest uh, 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 testing has just demonstrated that this issue is not going to go away. And for sure, India's actions are going to encourage other actors to consider uh, uh, ASAT test guidelines. So is that a, an emerging issue around? Could we think about, and that came out in the last session, uh, norms about distance and proximity that could have a technical underpinning but is structured around guidance that is self-interest and self-restraint on, on voluntary figures. 
Um, can debris be a standing item for discussion where we accept that there's a corpus dimension, we have peaceful uses dimension, we accept that there's a, a Geneva dimension, and might there even be, as the Chinese proposed, a formal and a more structured interaction between the CD and uh, other bodies, in, in this case, copious? Might that be a form? Space situational awareness, is that a, a, a vehicle for, for action in uh, either one or both of the bodies also using a formal exchange, or maybe uh, experts uh, and for capacity. So I, my sense was that we might need to take a pragmatic approach of three to four issues, and that could be the agendas for whether in discussions of the CD, but would require a more co a commitment to a structured interaction with with other bodies. I do think that there um, the emergence from what we learned about the GGE, that there's some room and some scope to consider some legal instruments and legally binding instruments, and that any progress on voluntary norms will require a commitment to that parallel legal commitment. And might that be uh, issues around deliberate destruction of um, satellites? So norms on restraint from what might, might be the more aggressive actions. Again, I know that I can already hear that, well, how would we define that, intent, attribution, et cetera. But I'm, I'm suggesting that progress on voluntary norms will require a commitment to, be, to, to engage in, on possible legal, um, uh, legally binding instruments. And then finally, if we're looking at the multi-layered approach to space security across our, our different fora, I think we also need to accept um, that we need uh, something, a much more interactive discussion about the multi-layered at the international, regional, and national level, particularly when we think about the regulation and the engagement um, of private sector and commercial activities. And here I want to just flag in the cyberspace, it's become much more acceptable to talk and engage and look at the, the full range of, of legal uh, levels, um, beginning with uh, regulatory at, at domestic levels. That's not something we bring to the table often in, the, in our arms control frameworks. The black box of the state is one that we continue to feel very protective toward. But could that be in an engagement on um, exchanges, either in the CD or another format, perhaps in the, in, the first, in the General Assembly, in the context of exchanges of national policies on regulation of commercial state act, uh, commercial actors, with a view to at least transparency in that space? So I'll stop there. Um, I know your it doesn't capture at all the richness of your discussions, but I look forward to, to the continuation of the discussions. Thank you, Renata. Uh, extremely interesting. And I, I took one point here that I think is vital for our future discussion. That is really the technical dimension. The technical dimension, technical issues on the table, but where, where to bring them up. So we will come back to that. Uh, we now move on to Peter. Thank you, Nicholas. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, firstly, I'm pleased to see that this panel recognizes the importance of a multilateral approach to addressing the issues of space sustainability, space safety, and space security in a comprehensive manner. Yesterday, we had some discussion about what it means for space actors to be dominant or predominant. And while predominance can be achieved unilaterally by actors in a certain context or at certain times, space safety, space security, and space sustainability can only be achieved collectively. The next point I would like to emphasize is that the is the importance of how we frame these multilateral discussions. Given the consensus approach to decision-making multilateral bodies such as COPWAS, it is important to choose topics and themes that emphasize our common interests and concerns. In other words, let us concentrate on the issues that unite us rather than the issues that divide us. During this conference, we've heard of the growing number and diversity of space actors. These new actors have very different levels of capability and what may be deemed as irresponsible behavior by an advanced space actor could represent the very best efforts of a less experienced emerging space actor. This is why when we talk of developing international norms, we need to bear in mind that in multilateral diplomacy, we can sometimes only move at the pace of the slowest actors. To those who say that this pace is too slow, my answer would be to say that this emphasizes the importance of capacity building another important function of multilateral bodies. And in this regard, I must take the opportunity here to commend the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs for their excellent efforts in this regard, as well as the many member states that have actively supported the office's capacity building efforts 
over many years. We also heard today of the importance of different cultural perspectives and language. For example, in English, we use the words safety and security, two words. In other official UN languages, there is just one word for both concepts. I can cite many other examples that I encountered during my chairmanship of the LTS process in Corpus. Then there are the cultural aspects of what defines acceptable or normal behavior. Marie Baja put it very well this morning when he said that behavior is not just about physics, but also a matter of culture and capabilities. Hence, for all these reasons, we need to have more and not less multilateral engagement and dialogue. Speaking of multilateral engagement, I want to mention in passing that we should find ways to incorporate the views of commercial and academic actors in these multilateral dialogues. This is not always easy in practice, but we should recognize that the non-state actors have a critical role to play in supporting these multilateral processes. And I want to turn to some next steps uh, of what I think we could uh, follow or pursue in a multilateral dialogue. I would like to begin by recalling that the 21 consensus guidelines for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities represents an important first step to internationally agreed norms of responsible behavior in space. And I hope that we can achieve consensus on the conclusion of this first phase of the LTS process and agreement on the way forward in the upcoming session of COPUS that will take place in Vienna a few weeks from now. Demonstrating implementation of the LTS guidelines is an excellent way of being transparent and demonstrating intent. Further multilateral discussions in COPUS should therefore include a component of encouraging states to report voluntarily their implementation experiences of these guidelines as a way to socialize them and promote the voluntary implementation of the guidelines by the widest possible number of space actors as a measure of transparency. The agreed guidelines represent the first low-hanging fruits of the LTS discussions in Corpus, and yet there's much work that still needs to be done. In addition to these 21 agreed guidelines, there were a further seven draft guidelines that could not reach consensus within the mandate of the LTS working group. To be sure, even these seven draft guidelines do not contain all the ideas that are pertinent to space sustainability, and it is quite possible to envisage additional topics for discussion. One example relates to the proximity operations in orbit. We did not manage to reach consensus on a draft guideline on this topic, but as we saw earlier today, there are already demonstration missions being carried out in orbit. <coughs> While in the beginning such missions may be carried out by experienced space actors, who is to say that in future such activities may not be carried out by much less experienced actors? We should have some basic high-level guidance for the responsible conduct of such operations in orbit. We also need to discuss a process to introduce and assess topics for new guidelines. In short, COPUS still has a lot to do in the area of LTS. I would now like to turn to the issue of transparency and confidence building measures, or TCBMs. There has been much discussion of TCBMs here in the past two days. I would like to observe that the LTS process itself and the extensive sharing of knowledge and experience that is contained within the agreed guidelines is in itself a TCBM. Moreover, some of the LTS guidelines also effectively constitute an implementation of some of the TCBMs that were proposed by the 2013 report of the GGE on TCBMs in outer space activities. I recall that the consensus report of that GGE was the subject of a GA resolution 68-50 that was co-sponsored by China, the Russian Federation, and the United States, and was adopted by the GA without vote in December 2013. That work was carried out under the auspices of the UN First Committee. I mention this as an example of another multilateral process that yielded positive outcomes in terms of building common understanding and how these processes in different UN fora can reinforce each other. The next area for further multilateral work is to improve coordination among national regulators. Several years ago, the legal subcommittee of COPUS convened a working group on national space legislation. That working group produ produced a set of elements com commonly found in national space legislation 
that serves as a valuable resource for countries wishing to develop national regulatory frameworks for space activities. More countries are witnessing the emergence of private sector space actors. Many of these space actors have no funding connection to that state and their activities may go unnoticed by the competent state entities for some time. Also, there are now many more possible international partnerships that can be formed among non-state entities, further complicating the implementation of Article 6, uh, the Article 6 provision in the Outer Space Treaty that requires states to provide authorization and ongoing supervision of the space activities of non-governmental entities under their jurisdiction and control. While most commercial space actors wish to be responsible users of outer space, we cannot exclude the possibility of rogue actors ignoring international norms or deliberately violating national regulatory provisions, and indeed we have already witnessed such behavior. We also heard an example earlier today of how the proliferation of know-how that lowers barriers to entry for participation in space activities that have up, up until now been considered very specialized is a real possibility and I think something that groups such as this should pay more attention to. Here again, multilateral fora could look at mechanisms for enhancing coordination and cooperation among national regulators. I've mentioned some of the processes carried out under the first and the fourth committees of the UN. In the last part of my intervention, I would like to share a few thoughts on how we might bridge some of the discussions in the various structures under these two committees. The challenge is how to conduct the discussions in a way that respects the mandates of the various bodies. The problem is that so many of the technologies and activities have dual use potential that this has led to a kind of paralysis with critical issues being discussed in neither corpus nor the CD. I point to the example of active debris removal, which has not been seriously discussed in corpus because of its potential dual use applications. That may be all well and good from the perspective of maintaining a clarity of mandates, but the reality of the matter is that non-state actors are not waiting for the UN to decide where to discuss these matters. They're going ahead and planning, developing, and conducting test missions. So what to do? There have been a number of joint meetings between the first and the fourth committee bodies, and these have been good for exposing the delegates in each forum to the work of the other. But now we need to move to the next stage of making these joint meetings lead to some more tangible cooperation and coordination to address matters of common concern to both bodies. In my mind, one possible way to make progress would be to look at these issues through the lens of space safety and to focus on behaviors rather than technologies. This may help to inject the necessary sense of urgency into the discussions while at the same time reducing some of the political obstacles to discussing these issues. In conclusion, the Secure World Foundation is pleased to continue working with member states and with UN entities under the first and fourth committees to support dialogue and progress on these important issues. We are always open to suggestions on how we may be able to support your efforts to promote cooperative governance of space activities as one of the means of ensuring that all nations can continue their activities in the peaceful use and exploration of outer space for the benefit of all humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It, it strikes me that the, uh, the 21 guidelines um, on LTS, that that's maybe the most detailed, most technical agreed, I would say, text so far in many, many years in Cooper's context. So I would like to hear from you later on how can we capitalize on that fact that member states have, in fact, agreed to a text that is of that profound technical and detailed deep level. So we come back to that. Now, Paul, please. Thanks, uh, Nicholas. Um, you know, in making these remarks, I'm reminded uh, of our conference's subtitle, Supporting Diplomacy clearing the path for dialogue. As that title suggests, the path ahead for the space security dialogue is currently rather obstructed. It is filled with the debris of great power storms and entangled with various outgrowths of both national and corporate activity. Clearing a path forward in such circumstances is going to require an effort that hasn't been seen in this realm since the early days of the space era. 
Of course, a precondition for having a dialogue on space security is the willingness of concerned parties to engage in one and to be prepared to listen to one another respectfully. In considering the recent experience with multilateral discussions of space security, we have to recognize that at least one major spacefaring state has been reluctant to engage in such processes. In the UN context as well as here in the CD, there has been a deep and prolonged difference in threat perception and a similar divide over what would constitute appropriate remedial steps. Most states have voiced support for preventive diplomacy, geared to maintaining the non-weaponized nature of outer space and open to space arms control as a means of achieving this. China and Russia notably have proposed an international legal instrument to prevent placement of weapons in outer space and the use of force against space objects, the PPWT. Brazil and several other states have also advocated negotiating some form of legally binding agreement regarding space security. Uh, the US, however, has generally rejected arms control in space with suggestions that it is either unnecessary or unverifiable or both. With this clash over the desirability of legally binding agreements, it was understandable that multilateral discussion has sought to see if the development of political arrangements, so-called transparency and confidence building measures, might serve to allow for some collective action on space security. And indeed, uh, the consensus result of the 2013 GGE on TCBMs provided some short-lived hope that states would take up these recommendations. Unfortunately, we have now entered a period of deteriorating relations among the major spacefaring states, including a sharp peak in accusations that states were developing offensive space capabilities with the intention of targeting the space assets of others. The reemergence of ASATs by China, the United States, and most recently India, has raised a specter of destructive space conflict that had been dormant for over half a century. Against this backdrop of growing mistrust, suspension of bilateral strategic dialogues, and the apparent development of counter space weaponry, it becomes more difficult, if arguably also more necessary, to promote the TCBM measures previously suggested. And I remind you that the UN Secretary General in his agenda for disarmament has also stressed the importance of carrying this TCBM work forward and has tasked ODA, uh, the Office of Outer Space Affairs, and UNIDIR uh, to explore ways of doing so. If multilateral dialogue and action is to progress, I think it would be necessary to alter this adversarial environment and the threat perceptions that animate it. While, given my background, I have the greatest of respect for the diplomatic arts, I don't see much scope for productive diplomacy without tackling this central blockage. I do see some promise in this respect from developments in the non-state sector that could provide support for renewed work on space security, and I'd like to briefly mention these ideas now. First is increasing the involvement in outer space activity by the private sector and the associated realization that irresponsible state behavior could ruin their business model. Some powerful corporate personalities are active currently in the space field, and their lobbying of governments on behalf of international cooperation in preserving a benign operating environment in space could be decisive. Second, civil society is showing some signs of waking up to the dangers that extending Earth, earthly conflict into space would represent. Conferences like this one, plus a myriad of space-related meetings, are educating and developing a constituency for advocating responsible state behavior. Third, the major enhancements underway in space situational awareness offer an important technical tool in support of monitoring state and non-state action in outer space and could 
eventually assist in the verification dimensions of future space security arrangements or agreements. Fourth, and I admit this is currently more of a hope than an evident trend, the escalation of threatening rhetoric and action by certain powers is reminding the broader international community of what is at risk if outer space becomes a battleground. I would expect this group of states, states especially influential middle powers among them, to become more active in looking for ways of countering the nascent space arms race and safeguarding this vital, if quite vulnerable, environment. It would be timely for a Friends of the Elder Space Treaty group to emerge to champion preserving space as a shared realm for peaceful purposes and to remind us of the better angels of our nature that have motivated international space cooperation over the decades. To conclude, clearing the path for dialogue will be a daunting task in the current adverse geopolitical context, but one that the space security stakeholder community will need to dedicate itself to with renewed purpose and energy. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. You really put the finger on the complexity in diplomacy. Thank you for that. Now, on the GGTCBM, um, it was unprecedented. It was a surprise to the overarching community, the first time ever that safety, security, and sustainability were addressed in the same document stemming from a GGTCBM in space activities process. And it was the first time ever there was a mandate given to UNOSA, UNODA, and UNIDIR to work together. So that was tremendous. And we had a very good few years after that report. Now it seems that we have to regain and to get further. Xavier, give us now hope. <laughs> I will try. <laughs> Being the last in line, I will uh, first say that I, 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 uh, I share the remarks that have been made uh, previously by my fellow Panelist, and by the way, this is making my uh, intervention maybe, hopefully not, uh, somewhat redundant as on some points. But still, I, I would like just to, and, uh, and again, repeating that I really share what has been uh, brightly exposed by my predecessors. I would like just make some points and give you some some non-hierarchized elements regarding uh, our issue today. Uh, first. What I take from this conference, and it's confirming for me a, a move that we've been analyzing for years already, it's inter interdependency on the rise. Uh, and, and that make uh, um, uh, things uh, complicated with the multiplicity of systems, multiplicity of actors. And by the way, uh, this makes private actors, both actors but also possible victims. Uh, and the more system we have in space, uh, the more liberty and freedom we have in space in terms of operating, the more boring it becomes, and the more robust transparency mechanisms we need. And I think we're really in this uh, particular situation. Of course, obviously, and I will repeat what has been said already, uh, space situational awareness is a good example. We have many bilateral relationships, and these relationships do not prevent uh, any multilateral system, in my view, to emerge, even if with difficulty. And in this, you can take the example of the European Union. Uh, we have this kind of collective effort. And despite the difficulty, and I won't negate the fact that um, these agreements inside the European Union are not always easy, uh, the EU keeps on moving, producing its effort in, in this area. And that's a good laboratory, I think, uh, as, as in many other issues, by the way, as in many other domains, uh, seeing how sovereign states can interact for sharing, uh, both in the, in the term of, in, in the sense of sharing the governance, but also sharing the data. You, you both have governance and data policy issues associated with it. And this is, this is what it make, it's making things uh, difficult. And one aspect in this that you can note is one risk 
is the existence of dissonant perceptions between those who know and those who don't know. Uh, we're in an interdependent arena, and the level of knowledge of each actor is a fact of life that is playing a role in their behavior. Uh, we, uh, uh, in other terms, we mentioned the notion of better understanding the intent, and that's true. It's not enough to detect, it's not enough to monitor, we have to understand what's going on. But to, in my eyes, uh, uh, any multilateral system must go a bit beyond this, and it must ensure political legitimacy and, and, and politi to, to, to allow political engagement, collective engagement. And this is based on trust, mutual trust. Cooperation works when partners are fully confident in the relationship. And this is really something that we have to keep in mind. We mentioned technology in a previous panel, AI, artificial intelligence, for example. Yeah, we will have a, a, an awful wealth of data to, to deal with. We'll have to invent new tools to make this data um, smart, in a sense. But we'll have to take with us any country who wants to participate, and we have to make these things transparent enough so it becomes politically legitimate. This is very important, and this is the key, in my view, uh, for a good multilateral cooperation. Uh, another point, we can certainly envision a, a multilateral system for surveillance and tracking. At a time when nations themselves go beyond this, and, and, and nation more and more deal with space situation intelligence. Uh, it's interesting to see that this notion of having a common understanding on, 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 on the status of the environment, detecting, cataloging, can be something that can be shared. It can be a first step in a multilateral agreement to share data. It doesn't mean that nations would go, won't go beyond this in having possibilities, technical possibilities to better characterize what's, what's in orbit. But I think if we reflect on this, we have a possibility, we have a margin of maneuver here to get agree on a cooperative basis internationally, to get agree on some level of data sharing. And it's interesting to have our, in our previous panel also, the private sector explaining to us that they have a, a lot of uh, means, technical capabilities to already on their own have a, a, an understanding of, this, of the um, um, situation in, in space. So this is something, of course, it's, it's always frustrating to be second in a sense, you know, and to be, uh, uh, you know, dealing with issues uh, that, that nations themselves have already dealt with and, and they are doing something else. But it's a first step and this is something that could be done, I think, at the, at the minimal, with minimal effort. And uh, also another issue, uh, transparency and mutual confidence mechanism are intrinsically positive moves, even if strongly limited, possibly technically. The merit of multilateral uh, uh, arrangement is keeping alive the awareness of global consequences. And this is what the Hague Code of Conduct, by the way, is doing. If you look at the A Code of Conduct, this um, um, tool we presented to you this morning, uh, you will realize that the information that is conveyed through, the, through the, the mechanism of this code are not highly sensitive information. Uh, the information regarding pre-notification of launches, for example, it's just on a sheet of paper like this. But the fact that any signatory countries uh, is, is engaging itself in providing this information under this form is already a very key political uh, uh, decision for each of them. Though I think uh, it has virtue in itself, trying to uh, uh, um, build a, a, a multilateral uh, uh, platform. So, in its, in, 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 just to conclude now, uh, such an instrument is not an end in itself, and it has to be understood very clearly. But it's, uh, it must be seen as a platform to imagine collective solutions. And, and once you have something like this, you can then start discussing and getting into the details when needed and at the pace that is uh, uh, useful. 
So I will stop there. And again, I will uh, 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 reaffirm that uh, that's been said previously on, on these uh, possible steps uh, forward uh, are really, um, I think, the good, the good approach to consider. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Xavier. And um, you really pointed to uh, the uh, multiplicity of actors. And of course, we, we in all our forums, we are all emphasizing the role of private sector, commercial companies. The question is, how do we integrate private sector into a multilateral, multidisciplinary dialogue with governments? It's, it, it's really something that we need to, to address. Now, I, I'm going to ask you, um, each of the panelists, um, one question, and then we open the floor for um, an interactive dialogue with all of you here. Uh, the following. Do we need to find uh, an alternative way ahead? Do we need to find a, a new way of approaching this? Um, because we have tried a lot of, of different uh, processes. Uh, do we need to find something new that we haven't thought of? Now, the second question is, we know that we have this joint C1, C4 um, General Assembly um, meeting slash panel discussion. We have had three. We will have the fourth one now in October in the General Assembly. And I would like to know and to seek some ideas on how could we use that as a catalyst, as a catalyst for other more detailed uh, technical uh, uh, processes uh, in our respective forums. So these are like two questions now. I was starting with you, Renata. Any ideas? Uh, I thought there were a fair few ideas over the course of the last few days, but I, my own view is that you can't, well, I, I feel a bit like mm -hmm. Donald Rumsfeld, known unknown. Mm -hmm. So if I knew the new idea, I'd know the new idea. But just to say that, I think I think where we're getting at is how can we build on the recognition of the overlap in these issues between space security, space safety, and space sustainability, and to break out of the, um, the, the, the fairly artificial divisions that we have had in terms of policy and discussions at the intergovernmental level. And can that be done? through a form of a structured dialogue around one to two areas. My, I think, contention is that having an overarching discussion across the full reins of an arms race is not going to be productive. Mm. So can we find some entry points on specific issues or, or areas? And there I would say that I think you've heard a lot of the issues that are out there, debris being one, space situational awareness being another, ASAT voluntary test lines being another, um, on advanced on orbit, maneuvers being another, um, and what might be the structure of that to look place. One option is for the first and the fourth committee, to get to your second question, to agree on the establishment of a group of scientific experts or a certain formatted engagement to take forward of those. Um, my own view is that we probably need a more structured ongoing discourse or dialogue between uh, working groups uh, at the CD level, if there was ever to be uh, agreement on those working groups, and, and um, Vienna, a, a more sustained dialogue. And then I will just uh, flag that as we look at these issues, um, and you talked about the private sector, there are models where we're beginning to look. Um, I mean, there are models at the intergovernmental. ILO is celebrating 100 years. ILO, from the outset of its governance structure, has had a framework and a way for bringing in um, actors, non-state actors. There's, a, in this town alone, the Global Trust Fund on getting rid of tuberculosis, uh, uh, t uh, tuberculosis malaria, et cetera, uh, has a structure and a format that's very interesting. So there are alternative governance models out there. Uh, we are looking at intercessional models. Uh, now in GGEs and in other processes about organized structured meetings with the private sector. The problem with it is, and I think this is the issue that we're not discussing here so far, the private sector means different things in different countries and different cultures, and how private private is understood to be and how responsible private is understood to be is a challenge for us. And I think that that's where I think we need to look at um, accepting that it's going to be necessarily regionally focused, necessarily um, multiple dialogues, and necessarily not at this point in a decision-making um, body, but more decision-shaping by virtue of those discussions with the private sector. Thank you. Uh, Peter, um, what do you think? Um, 
do we need to think out of the box anything new? How can we find new approaches to, to what we're aiming here? Um, also capitalizing on, on the fact that the LTS guidelines are, are so detailed, they have so much information. How can that be used in the overarching broader perspective of space security? Thank you, Nicholas. Well, um, I can only say that I, I concur with everything that uh, Renata said. It's, um, uh, I, I think that encouraging closer interaction um, between the first and fourth committee bodies uh, would, in my view, be a, um, a worthwhile uh, route to pursue. And uh, I completely agree with her that it would be a good idea to identify a few areas that would be of common interest to both bodies. So. Um, uh, for me, it would be the areas of debris, the rendezvous and proximity operations, and also the, um, the whole area of information sharing, which is, of course, critical to, to SSA, the success of SSA, and perhaps to see these through the, the lens of space safety. Um, and then in terms of the structures, uh, I like Renata's suggestion of perhaps having expert groups looking at this, because we had a very, very positive experience in Corpus. Um, Nicholas, you mentioned the richness of the LTS guidelines, and this is because we began the process by convening expert groups, which um, really involved experts. I mean, there were a few diplomats uh, in the discussions, but uh, largely it was, it was experts that came from um, national uh, space agencies, but also some from the private sector and from academia, and this really enriched the discussions, and it should not surprise anybody that the first um, set of guidelines that were agreed were largely based on the work of these expert groups. So if we could find a similar format to hold such expert discussions under the auspices of some joint first and fourth committee um, uh, interaction, that would be good. Um, I acknowledge, of course, there are challenges with this, with this because expert groups aren't serviced by the secretariat, but we can perhaps find a way around that. Um, Turning then to the, the second part of your question about the, um, how we can capitalize on the very rich um, content in the LTS guidelines, well, of course, I think the very first thing we can all try to do is to implement the guidelines uh, at national level um, and um, to promote the uh, awareness of these guidelines uh, among our um, uh, space entities uh, at national level. And then to report on a voluntary basis the implementation experiences of these guidelines, both as a way of socializing them to the broader international community, but also as a way of trying to universalize them in some way and promote their implementation by as many states as possible. And then um, another way that I think we should capitalize on the work already done in Corpus is to formalize the conclusion of the first phase of the LTS work. Now, this formalizing the, the conclusion of this is something that eluded Copos in June last year. I am hopeful that we may still um, be able to formalize the, the guidelines um, uh, through uh, the um, consensus, uh, reaching consensus in the report of Copos and perhaps some appropriate form of expression in a General Assembly resolution. Um, and also, of course, this would be coupled with um, some decision on the way forward for LTS. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, Paul, yesterday in the first panel, you actually brought up the uh, joint uh, C1, C4 meeting slash panel discussion, and that it needed uh, a, a, new, a new push, a new topic, something that could unite both bodies, but driving and, and, and moving the process ahead. Uh, what do you think, having, having heard the other speakers of the panel? Yes, well, I'm uh, in uh, complete accord, uh, really, with the ideas. I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the similarity of, of uh, uh, Renata and, and Peter's comments with my own, and I think maybe that's a good sign that in a similar wavelength, in terms of, of both identifying the kind of topics that would represent common interests um, from um, the two constituencies, um, in terms of bridging what at times has been um, uh, a, a counterproductive um, compartmentalization of the first and fourth committee. Um, uh, at the same time, we have to begin conceiving of this 
um, as a process that is not just a half-day panel, um, but uh, a structured uh, dialogue that is results-oriented, uh, that uh, has uh, some ongoing um, uh, intercessional activity, if you want to put it that way, you know, between the General Assembly uh, sessions, and uh, that uh, has that expert um, uh, characteristic, which um, uh, we have noted, uh, as Peter has reminded us, uh, has been um, effective in being able to uh, develop uh, the substance of some of the challenges uh, without too many um, political barnacles uh, around around them. Um, and in that um, in that regard, I, I also um, feel we have to recognize some of the limitations of some of our existing mechanisms. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when uh, UN GGEs were actually composed of subject matter experts uh, rather than serving uh, foreign ministry uh, officials. And, and surprise, surprise, and now they, in many cases, replicate the same kind of intergovernmental discourse that we would have in many other fora. I think we have to find a way of returning back uh, to that earlier uh, time. Uh, Nicholas, you, you talked about how to integrate um, private sector um, uh, representatives. Uh, well, I'm reminded of, a, again, a practice uh, that uh, I know at times Canada uh, utilized in the past, which was simply to invite them onto official delegations to some of our existing mechanisms. And, and for that matter, um, that was also extended to uh, uh, some NGO representatives, uh, civil society and, and academia. So that uh, clearly is, is uh, open um, to uh, all of us. Uh, you know, if we really want to be creative, uh, uh, Renata reminds us there are different models that can be uh, uh, utilized. Uh, I think um, uh, if we uh, can uh, stimulate uh, some true ongoing um, expert exchanges on a selected number of topics, uh, this might um, yield uh, results we can deal with. But I think, and that was part of my earlier remarks, we have to kind of restore a sense of common purpose among us, too, in terms of the uh, political uh, actors. Um, and I, for some time, for instance, have, have um, advocated that what we need, among other things, is an initial meeting, an initial um, conference of states parties for the Elder Space Treaty, uh, which, uh, as a very early uh, multilateral um, uh, security accord, lacked follow-up provisions. Um, and frankly, one of the, I thought, promising elements of the um, unfortunately uh, aborted EU code of conduct was it attempted to provide some of those uh, institutional uh, supports. So I think uh, there would be scope as well uh, for uh, the governments uh, to uh, uh, recommit themselves uh, to our foundational treaty. And uh, that could also uh, help uh, supplement uh, the uh, expert uh, uh, discussions. I think I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. Javier, I, I'm going to be a bit provocative now. Uh, you mentioned H. H. Koch, uh, and yes, indeed. And, and um, I, I remember when I was a delegate before to Coopers, I was also a delegate to H. Koch. So I was moving from the Coopers context to the H. Koch. And I never really understood uh, the sensitiveness in, in not being able to discuss the registration regime under space law and the HCOC uh, pre-launch notifications for civilian space launches also. And we, of course, we know that the registration regime deal with the payload, so it's the objects being placed in orbit. Nevertheless, the HCOC regime deals with the launchers and the upper stages are also sometimes being uh, objects for, for a certain period of time. And there is still this sensitiveness and the two communities being ho holding their meetings in Vienna in the same building. Uh, there is no communication between them. Do you have any thoughts on how to unlock that, if possible at all? Uh, well, we can... I guess at least um, uh, that w when when the Edgecock was proposed and and, and 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 signed by a number of countries, 92, 93, in 2002, a number of countries uh, objected that uh, the Edgecock was, uh, I would say, characterized by what they called the original scene of the MTCR, mm -hmm. and there was this notion that the Edgecock was something that was proposed by group 
of countries, uh, which uh, had as an objective to in fact exert some sort of a control over the development of, of technology in, 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 uh, in emerging countries uh, for, for most of it. And it has taken many years of discussions and, and, and exchanges to convince the, a number of these countries, you know, from 92 to 140 today, that of course this was not the case, and, and that this was, again, this was not a control regime, but a transparency at TCBM, uh, and that nothing in the HCOG was uh, 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 made, built for controlling anything. And this also explains why the pre-notification is so simple in, in what it describes. And precisely, there was no political interest in, in making it more demanding in terms of what would be the information that would be transmitted through this mechanism. Uh, it's interesting to say that there's an annual declaration or so obligation is made. And there is also something else which is optional, which is the um, organizing visits of the launch site or, or missile test sites. And, uh, um, uh, it's not something that has been done very, very often. Uh, hopefully, it's, it's becoming something that can be discussed with more and more countries, more and more countries. But uh, going back to your previous question, and just to add, because I really share what you, what you said on, on, on uh, and this is also related to uh, what we see again in the European Union when we're talking about space cooperation. Uh, it's, it's key to come back to simple technical issues to be discussed, to be sorted out, possibly by expert groups, in an orderly fashion. Um, uh, people have, it's important that people are, are, are getting to know each other at the technical level, so that it helps, uh, uh, really, discussions to build from there and, and maybe uh, uh, help set a common agenda for more for high-level political discussions. And I think this is something that will be very important. In this particular case, I think the role of the private sector should be um, um, used and should be enlarged. And the private sector might be um, the right level to help discussions. And, and, and so that between things that states want to keep for themselves maybe for sovereignty reasons, and some data that they would be ready to, to exchange. And I'm talking here about SSA, of course. But regarding other issues, regarding um, the security of space systems, I think we also have to uh, moderate the ambitions. Uh, we have first to get agree on the perimeter of, 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 of issues we want to address in such multilateral fora, and I think Again, uh, your experience, Peter, with the COPUS and the LTS, even if it has not maybe produced what was expected, uh, but I think that might be a, a, a rich experience to, uh, to, to, to uh, construct, I would say, to build upon. And, and so this is my uh, few uh, elements here. Thank you. So with this first round, the, uh, the floor is open, including from private sector. So please, any questions, any comments, any views? What do we need to do? What do we need to do? The way ahead for multilateral dialogue. Come on, Moriba. Yeah. So um, you know, I've I'm going to say that I'm I'm relatively new in the kind of the policy and and more this this government sort of activity. Done a few visits to Copos and that sort of thing, and I really think that there is a strong, uh, very strong role for track two type diplomacy and being able to um, bring industry academics uh, uh, to the table and kind of, you know, have these sort of sidebar meetings where in the, in the United States uh, there's a story called stone soup and, and, and the idea is that uh, people that are just willing to collaborate and willing to bring something to the table, even though it might not be perfectly structured, can at least get something going. And that tends to at least be informative at this multilateral level 
on the possibilities of, of what can occur when true collaboration is had. So I think really trying to not just allow track two diplomacy to happen, but actually encourage it. You know, provide venues that actually are f fertile ground and encourage the development of track two diplomatic kind of engagements regarding this sort of collaborative nature. Really. Um, Australia, please. Thank you. I have one question and a couple of comments. Um, I think it might have been you, Peter, that talked about one of the um, one of the guidelines that you weren't able to get consensus on was around proximity guidelines. I'm just interested in a little more sort of information about why that was and what the hurdles were. Um, and then I was just wondering when you were talking about you know countries could implement the guidelines, raise their profile, and share kind of report. Um, I, I think reporting and transparency is really important, but my experience across a number of the, the treaties is that um, the information that's in the reports isn't always used and we don't actually talk about that information. So I'm wondering about, you know, is it something that, that could lend itself almost to a tabletop exercise where you're sharing best practice and that could be done, as Mariba suggested, maybe in a, in a one and a half track forum. And on the first and fourth committee, um, I mean, I like the idea of it, but as somebody who attends first committee um, with a small delegation, I have like so many things I have to do and you just um, trying to turn your mind creatively to something like that. Um, you know, there's a lot of thinking that needs to happen ahead of that because most of the people in the room at first committee for that panel are doing so many things at the same time. Thanks. Thank you. And while you, Peter, are, are thinking about your, your answer, I will give the floor to Daniel. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, since we're taking suggestions on possible ways to move forward, uh, as you know, last year we published a report in which we, uh, Unidir, uh, or myself, uh, was advocating for the adoption of anti-satellite test guidelines. And one of the reasons why I think we can keep coming back to something like this is that over the course of the discussions that we've had over the last year, yes, there were a lot of differences of opinion on how we can go forward with various approaches, but one area that we did see a lot of convergence was around the destruction of objects in orbit. So uh, I think there are multiple ways that we could approach this. I would see ASAT test guidelines as sort of being a, a first step in an area where I think we do have a fair amount of convergence. And if we're going to start talking first about a voluntary measure for that, um, there could even be the possibility of later talking about uh, a different approach for a treaty, perhaps something along the lines of a prohibition on the intentional destruction of objects in orbit. Now, that could be further down the line, and that's something that would certainly be much more long term. But I do think that ASAT test guidelines, uh, no debris, low debris, notification, could at least be a first step to remind this community what it's like to have a victory. To, to get across the finish line, and then once we get a taste for that, maybe we can start talking about further steps in the future. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Peter, um, so what, what was posed by, by Australian colleague here, um, do, do you have the, anything you want to, to respond in that regard? Uh, thank you, yes, thank you, thank you for the question. Um, so, um, in terms of, and I'd like to, to uh, respond also to Mariba's comment as well, if I may, please. In terms of the question about the, the guideline that um, uh, we discussed in COPUS on uh, proximity operations, ADR, um, I, I don't have the, uh, the text of the guideline in front of me, so I can't be specific right now, um, except to say that um, my sense of it as chairman of the process was that there were elements in there that delegations could work with, and we simply ran out of time. And I think that if we, if we had had more time, um, that might have been one of the guidelines that could have gotten through. But perhaps not in the form that it was drafted, but there might have been elements there that delegations could have worked with. And so um, I can imagine that if the um, LTS discussions resume, that uh, the, these, um, this issue will be on the table, either, either through that text or, or another text proposed by another member state. And I'm happy to liaise with you afterwards to, 
to show you the, the exact text we're talking about. Um, as far as the, the collection of information, you're quite right. Um, in terms of voluntary states voluntarily providing information, uh, it's very useful, but um, it has to be structured in some way, and I would hope that if the discussions in COPUS, the LTS discussions continue, that we also devote some energy to providing some kind of a structure for collecting this kind of information, because then it allows us to um, look at the information over the course of several years, perhaps to come up with metrics on the effectiveness of the guidelines and so on. And here, um, this is an area where I think we could work uh, well with the academic community to look at uh, these guidelines and their uh, effectiveness over the, the longer term. Uh, coming back to the comment that Moriba made about track two diplomacy, I can only agree with you, Moriba, it's very important. And it's actually quite interesting that the expert groups in COPUS for the LTS guidelines, um, COPUS is a negotiating forum, and the way the expert groups were organized and run was that they were a deliberative fora, not negotiating fora. And so that, mean, that meant that the expert groups would, we, we tried to, to work through consensus, and um, in fact we did. And so what that meant was that it was entirely possible that the product of consensus of an expert group could be overturned by this, the same states whose experts had produced that. Um, it, there were a few instances of that, but by and large, the outputs of the experts were preserved through the COPUS process. So um, yes, I think these, organizing these track two dialogues is, is a, a very valuable thing to do. And of course, it's one of the things that we at Secure will do. And um, it'd be interesting, um, uh, w w one, can, one can reflect on the, the expert group process that we had in COPUS, and it was kind of track 1.5. Before I take the question, uh, Xavier, you want yeah, to react? Just a quick um, uh, comment. Going back to Moriba's remark, I and the fully agree with Peter. And, and uh, again, I won't talk too much about the Edgecock, but by uh, the way, um, many, many outreach events have been conducted for many years under the form of Track 2 uh, Fora. And, 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 and the interest of having, in many, many different countries, a mix of officials academic and experts has been, has been a very, very efficient, in my view. And that might be, that doesn't explain the success in terms of a number of signatures, but I think this is helping a lot. And by the way, we've been told several times that this kind of uh, meetings, uh, basically one day meeting, one day, one day and a half, were the, at some point the only moment when people could really discuss uh, issues. Uh, uh, beyond, you know, the normal life of such a regime. So I think it's, it's key. Okay. Please, down there. Um, I don't can't see it. Institute for Planetary Synthesis. I wish to express my deep gratitude and sincere con <coughs> congratulations to all of you for your enormous endeavors for a better world and add a short message of hope. We are moving in a completely new era of synthesis, peace and harmony and are now experiencing the birth pain of a new civilization. This is a cosmic fact as we are moving out of the age of Pisces into the new age of Aquarius, which will last for the next approximately 2,300 years. Always when humanity changed from one age to another, the spiritual hierarchy has sent us a teacher like before Rama, Krishna, Hermes, Zoroaster, Buddha, and so on. And now it is Maitreya who is the teacher for the age of Aquarius. Uh, that is why Maitreya, the world teacher for all humanity, for people of all faiths and for those of none, and architect for the global transformation, as well as 14 masters of wisdom, our elder brothers, are now in a physical body in the world, ready to guide us through this most difficult transition and help us create a new world of sharing, trust, justice, peace, cooperation, and unity of all humankind. They cannot just come and interfere with our free will. They need an invitation to work openly together with humanity. BBC know Maitreya very well, as they have interviewed him in 1990 during six months and promised 
to inform humanity about this historic event. However, due to other circumstances, they were not allowed to do so. So my question is, do you know about that? And thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry, I don't know. I come from outer space, <laughs> I mean, from Vienna, uh, the Office for Outer Space Affairs, Service in Cooper, so I'm sorry we don't deal with those perspectives, but thank you for raising this. However, I have been instructed to close this panel now, so maybe you can talk to other panelists and other members of this room uh, after the panel would be grateful, but thank you for your points. So I will close this panel. Uh, by saying that, uh, we um, have completed most of our processes for this year. There is one, still one process, and that is the joint C1, C4 panel discussion, which will be held in October at the General Assembly. And for your information, uh, we started this uh, the first time it was a joint meeting, so it was a general debate. And you all know what a general debate in the General Assembly means. The second time, in 2017, we were instructed to organize a panel discussion. So my colleagues in UNODA New York and myself, and Michael Spies in UNODA, we put together a concept, we ran it through Coopers, and we developed the concept of a panel. We even provided questions in advance of the panel, and we circulated it all to member states. Then we had this panel where we focused on private sector and academia. It was a gender imbalanced panel, and Jessica West, you were part of it, so you know exactly. Now we have to move forward, really, and this time we, I have taken uh, good notes here, and I know that UNODA New York is listening in to this debate. So we hope that we will have an engaging panel in October where we might be able maybe to unlock something so that we can have that panel as a catalyst. So I thank you, um, the panelists, uh, for this exchange, and I thank you all for having listened. And uh, I don't know if there's going to be a no. There is not going to be any, 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 any recession now. It's actually the closing session with Paul Mayer. Good luck, Paul, and thank you so much. Yes, well, uh, I think uh, you will all agree that we have experienced a, a particularly uh, rich and timely discussion of uh, the key challenges uh, for the international community in trying to preserve uh, outer space for peaceful purposes. I think uh, we have had uh, one of the biggest turnouts uh, for our space security conference this year uh, in its history. And we hope to reach many more via uh, the YouTube uh, video of the proceedings, which was another uh, innovation. If only we had um, recruited a cat as one of the panelists, we might have been a real contender for the most viewed uh, video. Uh, <laughs> have to keep this in mind for next year. As it is, uh, John Bory has uh, kindly offered to cover the costs of next year's conference uh, out of the proceeds he received from the manufacturers of M&M candy uh, for his product placement uh, deal. On behalf of those organizers, I would like to express um, our sincere gratitude uh, to our governmental and NGO sponsors as well as to our quality lineup of speakers, moderators, and to all participants who have showed remarkable interest and stamina uh, for the last two days. A special note of thanks to my fellow conference conspirators, Victoria Sampson of the Secure World Foundation and Daniel Porras of UNIDIR. I wish all of you now safe travels back home and may the force be with you, if not necessarily the space force. <laughs> please, in the last um, expression of, uh, please join me in the last expression of appreciation as I declare the close of Space Security Conference 2019. Just to remind everyone, there will be one more event, free drinks. Upstairs, Salle de Pas Perdu, we will be having the opening of the photo exhibit by Marco Grubb.
fascinating. I've already seen it. And as I said, our Swiss colleagues are uh, being gracious enough to invite us for a drink. So please, join us upstairs.